Around 500 million years ago, continents were shifting, sea level was rising and falling, and glaciation was causing mass extinctions, and mountains were forming. So let's talk about early Paleozoic geology. To give a timeline of when the early Paleozoic was going on, it was going from the Cambrian to the Ordovician period, or that's generally when the early Paleozoic is defined, and the Cambrian lived from around 542 to 488 million years ago, and the Ordovician from 448 to 444 million years ago. In terms of the geology that was going on at this time, we had a supercontinent that was breaking up into smaller land masses. We had remarkably persistent sea level rise throughout the Cambrian period. And we'll talk about what that did to the geologic record. We had episodic Cambrian extinctions potentially related to the sea level rise, which were caused by climate change. We had Gondwana migrating south in the Ordovician causing glaciation and mass extinction. And the Taconic orogeny initiated the uplifting of the Appalachian region, which eventually became the Appalachian Mountains that we have today, but that was after many orogenic events, including this very first one in the early Paleozoic. In my Snowball Earth video, as well as I'm sure other videos, I talk about the Rodinia supercontinent. Rodinia was a supercontinent that formed before the Cambrian and the Precambrian, but just before we're leading up to the Cambrian period, Rodinia kind of reshifted into what's called Panatia, Panotia. I, I don't know how to pronounce. I only read these things, guys. I don't hear them said. Um, so then this supercontinent that was now formed broke up in the Cambrian period, the early Paleozoic, the time we're talking about today, uh, into the major super or not supercontinents, but like big land masses, Gondwana and Laurentia. And there was, uh, you know, smaller land masses like Baltica that were also major at the time, but uh, major two land masses were Gondwana and Laurentia. And progressive flooding of these continents occurred in the Cambrian. This was super high sea level rise that was just very persistent throughout the whole Cambrian period period. And it, you know, kind of helped with Cambrian explosion in terms of life because you had all these shallow epicontinental seas that were like perfect for like reef environments and ecosystems and warm, shallow environments that were well oxygenated and got sunlight and all these things. So that was great for that. Um, but in terms of which continents were most affected by this, the Gondwana continent was not super affected because due to orogenic or mountain uplift between around 800 to 500 million years ago in the Precambrian and then into the Cambrian, uh, Gondwana remained mainly above sea level. But other cratons or continental masses like Laurentia were subject to continued transgression of seas onto the landmass. By the end of the Cambrian period, very little land area remained on these cratons that wasn't covered in seas. And again, this was one of the largest persistent sea level rises in the Phanerozoic Eon, or basically the eon that goes from the beginning of the Cambrian to now. So throughout that entire time, it's been one of the major sea level rise events. And for this reason, it has its own name because this sea level rise came along with a lot of deposition along the outer edges of these continents where the margins of the seas were. And so we call this the sock transgression and the sock sequence, the sequence of rocks that it deposited, overlies what we call the Great Unconformity. The Great Unconformity is a period of non-deposition or erosion in the Grand Canyon region or strata and also found in other strata as well, but was first recognized in the Grand Canyon strata that represents around a billion years of missing time in the rock record. And if you're not sure what an unconformity is, it's exactly what I mentioned, the non-deposition or erosion. It's a, it's a surface in between two strata or rock layers in the rock record that is an erosional surface where either rocks that should have been deposited during that time were eroded away or they weren't deposited due to environmental conditions or whatever. And so we had a whole billion year time gap in between what's below the unconformity and above the unconformity in that what's below it is like a billion years older than what's above it. So 
where did the time go? And it's a major question, but it's a story for another day, since that is not, you know, what we're talking about from the Cambrian onward. In terms of the deposition that this sock transgression caused, we see concentric Cambrian depositional belts around Laurentia, which is uh, the craton that was there in the Cambrian that now makes up much of North America. Um, and we can see that these concentric bands of deposition represent marine deposition from those transgressing uh, Cambrian seas. And we can see this because they have a distinctive and predictable pattern. The innermost belt, or this brownish, uh, darkish brownish, tannish belt, is siliciclastics or detritus from the land that would have deposited right at the sea margin. The next belt is carbonate platforms fringed by reefs, something that would have formed in between the siliciclastic deposition from land and the deep water deposition. And What's after that in the outermost belts, you ask? Well, you guessed it, it's deep water deposits, so more like mud deposits and whatnot. And in these deep water deposits, there's the Burgess Shale, which is a super well-known fossil site for remarkably preserved Cambrian fossils because of the way uh, things could be preserved in the environment that the Burgess Shale represents. And I'll talk about that at the end of this video. However, the Cambrian was not just a period of sea and animal expansion. There were also major extinctions. This is a plot where you see percent of marine extinctions on the y-axis and age in millions of years on the x-axis. And so you can see the five big five mass extinctions that we define in the Phanerozoic era, the Ordovician Silurian, the Devonian, the End Permian, the End Triassic, and the Cretaceous extinction but the Cambrian also had plenty of extinctions as shown by these high bars here. And this was due to a lot of things. One of the things that caused a high percentage of extinctions in the Cambrian was evolutionary experimentation, something I talk about in my early Paleozoic life video, which I'll link up here if you want to check out. But there was something else that caused mass extinctions at the time, particularly of trilobites. And we can see a graph or plot kind of of these trilobite extinctions or at least the last three intervals of trilobite extinction shown here. Basically, the vertical bars show trilobite diversity and they dwindle at these extinction intervals. And the first event actually also wiped out archaeocyathids, those major reef builders in the early Cambrian that I talk about in that early Paleozoic life video. And the last event marked the end of the Cambrian period and the transition to the Ordovician period. But in between each one of these extinctions, trilobite bites were covered, as we can see by the increase in the vertical bars in between the events, um, greatly and even thrived. But what led to these episodic extinctions is not fully understood. None of these events correlated with regression or sea level fall, so that can be ruled out as that causes many extinctions throughout our history, but clearly not these. Uh, but oxygen and carbon isotope shifts correlate with each of the first five events, and that means that climate fluctuations are likely to blame because those affect carbon and oxygen isotope ratios. The first three events correlate with negative isotope shifts, indicating climatic warming caused those events. And the fourth and fifth event correlate with positive carbon isotope shifts, indicating cooling that was the cause of those extinctions. And there is unfortunately no clear evidence for isotope shifts or anything that suggests climate change as the cause for the last event. So that one remains relatively mysterious. Overall, these Cambrian extinctions, I think, are at least based on the things I can find, are relatively still open-ended. Um, there's still a lot of research trying to figure out why these happened. The Cambrian period was very mysterious for many reasons. Again, like the evolutionary experimentation I mentioned earlier, as well as just it's older, so there's not a great fossil record compared to later periods in Earth's history. Um, but, you know, 
These were mysterious extinctions that happened. Uh, moving now to Ordovician uh, geology, and first we'll start with paleogeography, uh, where the continents were and what was shifting to where. Early in the Ordovician, Baltica, that other continental mass that the supercontinent broke up into, was situated between the equator and South Pole at the time, but then as the Ordovician progressed, it moved north toward the tropics, and by the end of the Ordovician, limestones had accumulated accumulated in the area that is now the modern Baltic Sea. And these limestone deposits include oolites, which resemble the current carbonates being deposited in the Bahamas. So it was probably a very similar environment at the time. Gondwana, the larger landmass south of Baltica, migrated even further south toward the South Pole. And tillites, striations, and drop stones, or glacial deposits, indicate glaciation on the Gondwana landmass at the end of the Ordovician. According to these glacial deposits, ice sheets spread to within 30 degrees of the equator. So very much, you know, large spread of glaciation. And oxygen isotopes from the marine fossils at this time record this cooling trend. And the isotope ratios indicate that the volume of glacial ice was larger than any Pleistocene glacial maxima, or Pleistocene is the recent um, ice age. And so any recent ice age glacial maxima, it was, it was larger ice volume than any of that. So very much lots of ice. This caused a dramatic shift from the Cambrian period, which was sea level rise, to sea level fall. The sea level dropped dramatically as the ice grew, obviously, as it would, because the ice is taking water. And a minimum estimate for how much the sea level dropped is around 165 feet or 50 meters, but oxygen isotopes suggest that it was much greater. The glacial interval only lasted about half a million years, but had disastrous effects including draining the epicontinental seas that had formed in the Cambrian and allowed these communities of shallow sea organisms to thrive. And that caused mass extinction as well as cooling and glaciation and other things that also caused extinction. But the draining of the seas was one of the major things. And this mass extinction was the first of the big five mass extinctions throughout the Phanerozoic Eon that I mentioned earlier, called the end Ordovician or late Ordovician mass extinction. Now moving to Ordovician geology. So what mountain building events or tectonic events were building mountains at the time? During the Ordovician, the eastern margin of North America or what at the time was Laurentia was subject to tectonic activity that uplifted that margin and built mountains in what was called the Taconic Orogeny, or an orogeny is a mountain building event, so the Taconic Mountain Building Event. This was the first of three mountain building events or orogenic events that built the Appalachian mountain belt that we know so well today. And the second two events will be discussed in future mid to late Paleozoic videos. But this video will talk about the Taconic orogeny, which resulted from collision between Laurasia, the major North American craton at the time, and several islands. And the rocks in what is now the central Appalachians record the transition and deposition during this first orogenic event. What I mean by this depositional transition is that carbonates were bordering eastern Laurasia at the time before this collision event, and during the late Cambrian when this collision was happening, they became overlain by mid-Ordovician fleisch deposits. And fleisch deposits are just characteristic mountain building deposits that follow a predictable sequence of deep water shales and turbidity flows from material coming off the newly forming mountains and accumulating in the foreland basin. So these turbidites or turbidity flow deposits represent accumulation of sediment in a foreland basin scenario. And eventually the sediment was being supplied to the foreland basin by the uplifted region faster than the basin was subsiding. And by the late Ordovician, molasse sediments overlaid the fleisch sediments and molasse sediments 
are just another characteristic sequence that typically comes after flesh in which you have coarse, shallow marine and non-marine deposits in the form of clastic wedges because, you know, you're getting shallower as the basin fills and then eventually non-marine because it's just clastic material from the adjacent mountain. These clastic wedges then to the northwest, which was indicating the direction of transport. And in this case, it's a little interesting because instead of the subduction zone going toward or the subduction going toward the major continental mass, Laurentia, instead of going toward Laurentia, it was going away from Laurentia because Laurentia's eastern margin was actually a passive margin that connected up with oceanic crust that was being subducted under the island arcs that were approaching Laurentia at the time. So it was going toward the east, the subduction zone, underneath the island arcs, and the island arcs were uplifting and supplying debris to the closing ocean basin at the time in between Laurentia and the islands. And then as they approach, that basin was completely filled with sediment and clastic wedges. And this continued until the islands fully collided with Laurasia and Laurasia caused enough pushback to kind of stop the collision and the movement. These islands that collided with Laurasia are now accreted terrain in eastern North America that we can actually see some of in parts of Canada and the U.S. However, as we'll see later, more accreted terrain comes on after the tectonic accreted terrain later in the Paleozoic, and we'll talk about that in later videos. But the major takeaway here is basically everything that's east of the Appalachians is accreted terrain. It wasn't even part of the North American continent. And some of it even used to be islands, which is pretty cool. During the tectonic orogeny, two enormous volcanic eruptions in the tectonic island arc were triggered uh, within the same volcano throughout that time that spread remarkably thick ash deposits throughout the region, and the orogenic event or mountain building event ended near the end of the Ordovician. Throughout the Cambrian and Ordovician, unlike the eastern margin of Laurasia, the western margin of Eurasia remained passive. Remember that the passive margin just means that instead of a tectonic boundary or collision, at the boundary of the continent, it's just continental crust that thins into oceanic crust with no tectonic activity whatsoever. And it's important to remember that oceanic crust and continental crust are not equivalent to tectonic plates. It's not like all continental masses are tectonic plates and all oceanic crusts are tectonic plates. It The, the plates are lithospheric and the lithosphere includes the crust, but is not only crust. The lithosphere is like this whole thickness here and it includes both continental and oceanic crust. So in short, ocean and continental crust can be included and occur on one single tectonic or lithospheric plate. Anyway, with that out of the way, the continental shelf or the passive margin along the western part of Laurasia was dominated by carbonate deposition, which makes sense in a shallow marine, uh, non-tectonically active environment. And to the north in British Columbia, at the base of the carbonate bank was the depositional setting for the Burgess Shale. The Burgess Shale, as I mentioned, is a majorly famous fossil site with well-preserved soft-bodied organisms from the Cambrian period, and the deposition of this shale was at the foot of a steep carbonate bank at 200-ish meters depth where oxygen supply was limited. And because oxygen supply was limited, this limited the amount of burrowers and decomposers that could alter or ruin the preservation of the animals in that region. So since those things weren't around, preservation of animals that fell to this deep oxygen limited zone was incredible. And we have this incredible record in the Burgess Shale because of this. And if you want to learn more about the types of organisms that were preserved in the Burgess Shale and that lived during the Cambrian and Ordovician periods, you can see my early Paleozoic life video, which will pop up at any moment. And I also have my Ordovician extinction video where I talk about the mass extinction that was caused by the glaciation at the end of the Ordovician period. And if you want to check out the Earth History playlist, it'll pop up here any second. And if you want to check out the major reference I'm using for this and other videos in this playlist. It's called Earth System History. It's linked down below 
in my description. And if you want extra or bonus content, you can press join down below and you can become a channel member to get perks and extra content. Uh, but if you can't do that, I totally understand. You can still press the like button, which is totally free. And I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.